Chapter 4 Thomas and Bob took the boys straight to the hotel room. They had fallen asleep in the car. Bob carried the twins, one on each shoulder, and Thomas carried Edward. Once they were in bed, the brothers locked the door and went downstairs to dinner with their wives. The boys had been shown how to call down to reception if they needed their parents. The Turnbulls and the Hardwick Turnbulls were enjoying the atmosphere of one of the four luxury restaurants in the hotel. They had finished their meal and were enjoying port to finish. So do you think you two will be able to take care of our boys tomorrow? Beth asked, directing her question to Thomas and Bob. Yes, of course, Beth. I used to command troops, and I work with wild animals. I think that qualifies me perfectly, Bob answered. Beth and Rose looked at each other, then burst out laughing. Thomas joined in, then Bob, who had been trying to keep a straight face. Yes, dear, don't worry. You have a doctor and a vet looking after them, Thomas assured. What could be safer? Rose touched Beth's arm. Maybe we should cancel our shopping and stay here. They both started to convulse with laughter as their husbands feigned shock and disappointment. No, you young ladies go and enjoy your spree. Just spare a thought for our bank balance, Thomas advised. We do not promise anything, do we, Beth? Rose added. Thomas looked at Bob. Another brandy, old chap? Beth and Rose went to the suite to check on the boys, and they left Thomas and Bob to their brandy. The two husbands made themselves comfortable in a quiet corner of the bar. As they discussed the day's events, a familiar voice asked, Mind if I join you, gentlemen? Ah, Henri, please come, join us, offered Thomas as he stood up to shake his hand. Bob had already pulled up another of the leather armchairs. Once seated, a fine cognac ordered and delivered, the three dropped the small talk. Max, the British athlete, is in stable condition, thanks to your quick thinking, Doctor. Although he will not be well enough to compete, he will be sent home after questioning. Now I did find out that some trainers give their athletes a small amount of strychnine before they compete. They believe it gives the nervous system a boost and has an effect on the muscles and sharpens their focus. While such effects would be limited and could potentially destroy one's health, even small doses over a period of time, Thomas gave his medical opinion. Yes, I respect your medical knowledge, Tom. Unfortunately, there are no rules regarding taking performance in answers, so we really can't do anything. However, we could try appealing to their common sense and concern for their health. Well, perhaps I could write a letter appealing to the athletes to protect their health. Then you could use the committee to get it translated and post it in the Olympic Village, Thomas suggested. Maybe a brief letter so it will be quick to translate. Just leave it in my pigeonhole, and I will take it with me in the morning. Perhaps some may make wiser choices. Henri shook his head. There seems to be a major lack of good sense and good judgment today, Henri, spoke Bob. Yes, I am afraid you are right, my friend. I was hoping these games would not be a political statement, but a peaceful competition that would bring the nations together. I see, though, that the Nazi party has turned it into a vast propaganda machine. They are trying to prove how superior they are. And this brings me to my next concern, that Nazis are developing a drug or treatment that would turn their athletes into superhumans, perhaps even super-soldiers. Yes, rumour has it they are continuing to speed up the manufacture of weapons and military equipment, Thomas said concerned. So they're gearing up to expand their territory, Bob spoke. Why, yes, Bob, you are completely right about that. They have no interest in peace, Henri sadly replied. Do you know where these drugs and experiments are taking place? Thomas asked. Well, from the talk I overheard, there is a unit in prison in Dachau that's around 400 miles to the south of here. Why, what are you thinking, my friend? Henri raised his eyebrows. Thomas sat in quiet contemplation for a moment. Well, whatever it is, be very careful. As I mentioned, we are all now in the Gestapo sights, Henri warned. Henri excused himself and retired to bed. As he walked from the bar, Thomas looked around, and sure enough, two Gestapo walked out after him. Then Thomas spotted a man in a light grey suit, 
with a distinctive cane. He caught Franz Lieberman's eye for just a second. He then pulled the gold pen from his pocket and wrote a brief note on a napkin. As Thomas and Bob walked from the bar, they passed very close to Franz without acknowledging him, but Thomas dropped the small note. Next, Thomas stopped at reception and asked to use the typewriter. They had a particular room behind the desk, especially for this purpose. Bob headed back up to the room. Thomas sat in front of the small desk and loaded paper into the typewriter. He had learned to type in medical college, and it saved so much more time than handwriting everything. As he was near the end of the memo, he heard a gentle tap on the door. Come in, he uttered. Franz entered the small room. I have something important to discuss with you, Thomas stated. You may want to sit down. Franz sat on the only other chair in the room. Thomas related the events of the day and his meeting with Henri de Bally Latour. OK, leave it to me. Be prepared for a road trip on Thursday, Franz responded. How should I prepare? Just be ready at 5 p.m. We will get there around 10 p.m. Then we will stop to prepare and go in at 11 p.m. With that, Franz left the room. Thomas finished the memo, signed it with his gold fountain pen, and blotted the ink. He left the room and checked to see if anyone was watching. It was all clear. The young man at reception posted Thomas's memo in Henri's pigeonhole. The next day, Wednesday, August 5th, saw Beth and Rose on a shopping spree, while Thomas, Bob and the boys enjoyed another day of competition. The boys particularly enjoyed the discus throw. Ken Carpenter from the USA team won gold, and his teammate Gordon Dunn won silver. The day's highlight was seeing Jesse Owens live up to his reputation and win gold in the 200 metres. The crowd stood and cheered, chanting his name. They loved Owens. He was a real hero of the games. When they got back into their hotel suite, Thomas ordered room service as the boys were tired. Later, the two shoppers came into the suite with bags of expensive-looking clothes, shoes, and accessories. Thomas looked pale and Bob slumped in his chair. Had a good day, ladies? Bob asked. Of course we did, silly boys, Beth giggled. Just what the doctor ordered, Rose added. They dropped the bags in the corner of the living room. Oh, room service, aren't you boys sweet? Our feet are so sore from all that walking. Beth spoke, and Rose nodded in agreement. The family had a slow start to Thursday the 6th. They had a leisurely breakfast and made plans for their day. Bob and the boys were going to the football match held at 5.30pm in the Mumsen Stadion, where Great Britain was playing China. So they booked a car to take them around 3.30pm so they could get good seats. The boys were excited to be going to the match with their uncle. He was a bigger football fan than their dad. Beth and Rose planned to visit the spa for a day of relaxation. Thomas was going to leave on his exploratory mission with France at 5pm.